WNST, Towson to Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. It is an anniversary week. The Orioles cannot lose. The Ravens so far can't have anything go wrong at camp. And we get this little trading deadline thing. I, I feel like it's 1996 or 97 all over again. And I'm just, I'm not even at WNST yet. I'm just doing nasty Nestor sports forum afternoon drive and Pat Gillick's out trading. This is the most exciting trading deadline we've had in a long, long time. We're going to be over Costas on Thursday celebrating 25 years. Luke, I've got show and tell today. I know, you know, we're going to talk about beating the Blue Jays. We're going to talk trading deadline. Certainly whatever Ravens residue that we, we have, and I know you've been doing that. And players are talking and all that stuff, but I have some old school giveaways that we are going to have at Costas. Uh, I don't, you weren't around for Spank the Yanks, right? How old were you in 1996? I was 13 years old that October. I got socks older than you. Um, this is an original <laughs> Spank the Yank sign, the old Get Nasty signs. Um, you'll appreciate this. This is before you join me. This uh, is not Steve Bishotti, I assure you. This is uh, this is Steve McNair uh, from 2006. We had some Purple Free the Birds. Uh, let's see what else we have. Wacko for Flacco. How about that? You remember that. And then see Joe Throw. We did all that. And I know you handed... I have pictures of you with this one here. Believe in Joe and the Ray 252. These were the original signs from the parade in New Orleans. So uh, I'm giving all this stuff away. Uh, I have no way Ursays. I have fixed the teams. I have free the birds. I have shirts. I have hats, all of that stuff. Uh, we are doing uh, 25 years, all courtesy our friends at the Maryland Lottery. Even they're doing 50 years be giving these away. We had a $100 winner last week. Our friends at Window Nation, 866 Nation, with some new offers here uh, in August. And uh, Leonard Raskin. Uh, who cannot join us, but is sent along the uh, crab mallet that opens the beers. Luke, uh, we got a trading deadline here. And uh, look, I, you know, and I hope to get you down the drug city on Friday for a big boy milkshake before the Mets come to town. And I know we all have visions of sugar plums of adding pitching and adding more pitching and not giving up anybody and all that. As we get closer to this, I think we both have been pretty outspoken that they need help. They deserve help. They want help. What do you anticipate as we get up on this? Well, I, I think as we get closer and closer to today's deadline, 6 p.m., of course, being uh, the, the deadline, which is a little a little different than it's been in the past. But I can't say I expect anything huge, but I think and we talked about this over the weekend with Tyler Wells being optioned. You've got to add a starting pitcher. You've got to add another bullpen arm. Are these going to be moves that move the needle dramatically? for thinking about October and not just getting to October, but making a deep run? Probably not, but you need to get there first, right? You still have two months of baseball to go. We've spent so much time talking about the Tampa Bay Rays and we'll continue to, but the Toronto Blue Jays, go back to how they've played since early June. Their record is fairly similar to the Orioles. The difference is the Blue Jays have struggled in AL East play. Now, they've been really good against everyone else and they've struggled in the division. So uh, the point is, the rest of the, the division's not going away. I mean, okay, we maybe the Yankees, because they can't hit it other than Aaron Judge and kind of had another disappointing uh, performance for themselves on Monday night. But this is a tough division. We know this. So if you're Mike Elias, and I think Monday was a great example of this. My goodness, be remiss. Right off the bat, let's talk about Austin Hayes and the catch he made, uh, saving the game uh, in the ninth inning. I mean, one of the plays of the year easily. Uh, and every um, night a there's a different win. star. That's the magic of Orioles baseball. Yeah, it is. yeah, that was the magic of Orioles baseball. That was a Devereaux over the fence special. That was old school. No question about it. But it also was a reminder of just how difficult these games are on a night by night basis. Kyle Gibson gives the Orioles six really good innings. They needed that after Kramer and Wells struggled uh, at the end of the, the Yankee series. But you know, Danny Coulomb, Genier Cano wavered, you know, it really struggled big time. Uh, and Batista has to throw 35 pitches uh, and walked a couple batters, which, you know, he hasn't done a lot of here uh, of late, act uh, especially. So they got it done, but boy, they walked seven batters, you know, <laughs> including five from the bullpen. And I was some of their best bullpen guys. So uh, as I tweeted out in the moments after the 4-2 win, to me, this was a, first of all, a great win, you know, good win on the road, good win to start this four game set with the Blue Jays, but 
another reminder for Mike Elias, and he knows this, but this team absolutely could use some reinforcements, need some reinforcements. And I think the key word here at this point, Nestor, they deserve some reinforcements because these guys have played their butts off for four months now. And uh, I mean, it's just. But somebody's going to get tapped on the shoulder. It's not right? easy. Whether it's Westberg or like, if they're going to get anything real, they're going to have to give up Cows or Westberg. They have to give something up. Well, it, something in their system. I don't think it necessarily means they're going to have to give up someone on the major league roster. Um, you know, it, it all depends what the deal is. You know, I mean, that they, Nestor, they have so much minor league talent that, I, look, I'm not saying they won't trade Colton Cowser. I'm not saying they won't trade Jordan Westberg or, or someone else on the major league roster, but do they need to? No, because they have that much talent in their farm system. And I think that's where so many people are making this argument that, look, I, I've said it over and over and over. I don't want to see them decimate their farm system for one run here in 2023. However, if you have conviction about what you're doing as an organization, meaning your ability to draft, your ability to add international talent, which is still a work in progress on that front, but they've certainly made some hay there over the last couple of years, your ability to develop young talent, your ability to fix players when they arrive here, as we've seen them do with Ryan O'Hearn, for example, this year, a guy who had kind of washed out in Kansas City and looked like he was a quad A player. And, and he's been one of their best players over the last couple of months. Well, that's if what John looking... Means was. He was the original sort of, right? I mean, the, the original awakening to what they had down in Houston in the same way with, with Keiko, right? Like he, he was a guy that they sort of fixed. Right, right. So if you have the conviction and everything I just laid out and look, I've, I feel strongly about all those things that they're able to do. Then you look at this opportunity that you have at the trade deadline for right now to fortify your rotation a little bit, certainly to strengthen and augment your bullpen. These guys deserve this. The, the fan base deserves this. Uh, the, these players and coaches deserve this. Uh, again, and that's not to say that I'm, you know, impatient sitting here, you know, it, the, the, in many cases, waiting until right at the deadline can be beneficial. Other times it can blow up in your face. And you end up overpaying. So this is where we're finding out about Michael Elias in the same well, way. He made a deal out... a week and a half ago, right? He went out in the middle of the night, got this guy he thought was a seventh inning guy who's looked quite frankly, better than Cano's look the last two weeks, right? Literally. He has, he has since his, you know, since his, uh, what his second outing where things didn't go as well, but the the point is that, that I was trying to make is we're finding out about all these young players now playing in a pennant race in the same way we're finding out something different about Michael Elias and maybe more, more importantly, ownership, quite frankly, if we're talking about deals that require adding money and not to say that every trade requires adding payroll, but that's part of it, right? So we're finding out about this front office this current regime that we're at a different stage now in the same way that we're finding out about guys like Austin Hayes playing in a pennant race. Right. So uh, that's not to say that I don't, I don't have trust in Mike Elias or faith in Mike Elias, but we're finding out about how he proceeds being at a different stage of this entire process. Now the rebuilds over. We talked about that the second half of last year. So well, John Angelos was around making decisions, pissing $9 million away on Sid Fernandez 27 years ago. You know what I mean? So John Angelos isn't new to the, I mean, whatever he thinks he knows about baseball as a fan, as an owner, as a guy born on third and thinks he had a triple, whatever it is, there's been billions of dollars that have, circulated through this business hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year every year from national television revenue from mass and funny money all of that that's gone on don't tell me you don't have eight million dollars for a pitcher i mean like come on i mean well, stop. and i'm you I'm, know like I, that's i'm just saying not to you to him sure. to anybody that's listening don't let them cry poor i mean come on man come on no, I'm, I mean, no I'm one's going to buy that. that. I'm not going to allow that. Well, no one's going to buy that. And I'm not even suggesting that that's what, what is happening here, but that's part of the entire conversation going on right now. Uh, at some point in time, whether it's today, whether it's this offseason, whether it's the next tra trade deadline of 2024, whether it's the offseason after that, at some point in time, no, no matter how good the Orioles are right now, no matter how great their farm system might be, at some point in time, they're going to need to make a bold move if they want to get over the hump. I, that's just, 
I, I mean, look at the last 10 World Series winners. At some point in time, they made a bold move. The Tampa Bay Rays made a pretty bold move on Monday, uh, trading for a pitcher who, yeah, they gave up some really good prospects for Savali. And, and he's good, but there are also some, you know, you look at some of the underlying metrics and you kind of wonder, is, is there more to this? Do they see something they can untap with him? Uh, but my point is, we've seen the Rays make big moves before, too. Just because they're a low, you know, a small market team doesn't mean that you can't make bold moves. So that's where I'm not saying the Orioles must make a bold move today. But at some point in time, we're going to have to find out they're going to have to do that if they want to get over the hump, uh, meaning putting themselves in optimal position to try to win a World Series. Again, whether it's this year, next year, the year after that. Well, this uh, does go so, back to money. And at some point, you know. Every day, Henderson and, and Rutschman get more expensive. That's true. It was yeah. true of Machado. It was true of Lamar Jackson in the end. It, it, it's just – it's true of Joe Burrow right now, even though he's not throwing the football for a month. Like, it's just – that's where it is. So, you know, John Boy needs to put on big boy pants and – it's daddy's money and his franchise and mom. And all of a sudden, oh, my God, we're winning. What do we do? These are these really big whys in the road where you show that you know what you're doing and you have full commitment to doing things the right way. Or you're going to continue this 30 year course of we're going to promise something that's not going to be there in the end, because they're going to have to spend money, Luke. That's a, that's a fact, right? Like on something, on somebody, they're going to have to invest this capital. You know, they're going to have to spend a hundred, 150, $200 million a year at some point, if they want to keep three or four Rutschmans and Gunnar Henderson's around, because the other part of this is they're not drafting one, one anymore. Right. They're, right. they're done getting the Rutschmans and the, they're not going to get that. Well, anymore. Gunnar Henderson wasn't one, one. So I, your point is well taken, and I agree. It's, it becomes more difficult, but you better be able to still draft competently. And, and this is where I will give even John Angelo some credit because he hired Michael Elias and Sigma Adele, and they, they've had carte blanche to be able to run things from a player development they standpoint, spent from a, a standpoint nickel, of a real, a real nickel on money, in real money. They haven't spent any of anybody's money. I'm not disagreeing with you on that, Nestor, but I'm I'm acknowledging what has been different than the last 30 years. They never had a farm system like this. They never cared about that. Dan Duquette was selling off competitive, uh, you know, competitive balance picks to go sign a free agent. Uh, you know, th there was never a priority for that. But you're right. That's why I was saying we're getting to a different stage of this entire process that started in 2018 with the organization burnt to ash. Uh, and having a, a handful of decent prospects, and that was it. But we're now at a, they at had a stage a now. Yeah, and, and that's and that also suggests money isn't everything either, because they spent very unwisely in many cases. I mean, you know, money is not everything, but yeah, you're going to have to spend, and you're going to have to spend wisely, and and you need to be investing in the right players. So uh, that we're going to get to that point, but in the meantime. As you have all these young, controllable players, you want to try to maximize your ability to win. So, again, I'm not saying how much th that that's the only factor going on right now with the trade deadline, because there are players you you can acquire that aren't going to cost a whole lot. Uh, but I I've said it, they're going to have to be bold at some point in time here. Again, whether it's today, whether it's this offseason, whether it's trade deadline a year from now, uh, it, it, it's difficult for me. It's difficult for me to look at, at at them as they're presently constructed, as good as they are, considering they have the best record in the AL, but talking in terms of this team playing in October and playing into early November, which means a World Series, it's difficult for me to look at them right now and say that they're just going to stay the course and not have to make a big move at some point in time. And again, I'm not even saying I expect that today, but what I do want to see today is adding a starting pitcher who can raise the floor of your rotation. It, it, you know, Lorenzen from Detroit, you know, if they get someone like him who I get it, he's had a nice season, but he's 31. You know, he made an all-star team. Is he really a guy that you're, you're starting in game one uh, against Garrett Cole, hypothetically, although I'm not looking like the Yankees are going to be in the playoffs, but the point is he's not a legitimate ace, but he's someone that'll help you get to October and he's someone who can help you in October. Uh, he's not going to cost a whole lot uh, because he's a pending free agent. So there are moves to be made, whether you're talking about bullpen arms, whether you're talking about a starting pitcher, 
you know, whether that's a rental. Uh, I, I don't want to see Michael Elias overpay for that. And that's part of this process that he hopefully is reading the market correctly and is going to get to this afternoon, let's say. And there might be more options there than teams that are looking to st- can continue to buy. So maybe then he gets one of these guys for a lesser package of you know, third, you know, second and third tier prospects or whatever it might be. So, you know, you let it play out. But I think what's clear at this point, and you said this, and I, I wholeheartedly agree, when you see them on Monday night, great win in Toronto. Don't want to d- diminish that whatsoever, but it, it, it's a struggle for them right now in terms of looking at the pitching and saying, okay, how are they going to navigate the next couple months? Not to make the playoffs, because at this point, they're 90 plus percent. They better like, make the playoffs. Right. right. But the point is, you want to navigate this and not be in a position where, all right, you get to October, but two more starting pitchers are either hurt or shut down because they've gone so far over their innings. Uh, Batista's running on fumes because he's had to throw so much because Cano's not looking like the guy he was in the first half of the season. My well, that's what I was going to is... say to you. The, 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 the sky is falling piece of this that's happening right now, which is pitchings look worse than it's looked in a while, right? I mean, let's be honest. On the totality of what they have, they do not have an ace. They have very much a question mark in Rodriguez. Wells is on the skids. You're worried about innings with Bradish. Gibson, he is what he is, and you hope he stays what he is, which is a number four starter. Number three, I mean, like literally, but a veteran Sutcliffe kind of wisdom Yoda guy you want. Bullpen, been a mess the whole time, been overtaxed the whole time. Cano and Batista were incredible for six, eight weeks that padded you out and got you from 10 above 500 to 20 above 500. You're winning, 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 but. I would think if you're in an organizational meeting, this isn't sports radio or what those knuckleheads over in the fan are talking about or what I'm talking about when you're really in an organizational meeting, I bet you're concerned. You're trying to win a world series here. I bet when the door shut and you had the pitching coach, the manager, the real management people, people in Norfolk, people watching the pitching and saying, we need pitching. Forget John Angelos. He's not even in the room. Just a baseball decision. If we need to win, where are these innings coming from? If I'm Brandon Hyde, if I'm Mike Elias, and saying, where, how are we getting from here to there? We need help. So the first acknowledgement is, to your point, they're the smartest guys in the room, Luke. I would think that this has smelled a little bit like a fire since, I don't know, since Cano wasn't right right around the All-Star game, and things got a little weird with that twin series. And then Batista got lit up in the All-Star game. And from that point forward, they've won a lot, but they haven't looked great doing it or felt great doing it or you know, like in any of those ways. And they're starting to hit the ball. I mean, Mount Castle's hit, hit some home runs, and Henderson's muscling up and mostly healthy. But for the most part, they're mostly healthy. I, I, but this is... I would think they're on fire, not just you and me talking about it this morning. I would think this is a real critical issue inside of the organization today. Yeah. The the one thing I will stop you on, Batista has been great. Don't, don't give me the all-star game thing. He's been, he's been dominant. I I mean, Batista, he probably, he, I don't think he will be in this conversation, but he probably should be getting some, at least a little bit of fringe Cy Young award talk. That's how great he's been this year. So I'm concerned about him having to work as hard as he has just in general, but Monday's outing aside where he walked a couple batters, he's been great. So I'm not going to be thinking about bringing him in the eighth inning at any point. Right. And that's, and that, and that's the way to frame every night by a run or two, you're going to feel like you're going to pitch him four days a week. Right. And that, and I just wanted to frame that the proper way. Cano has looked shaky, Batista has been awesome. Uh, I mean, he's, he's been fantastic. He's got a 0.87 ERA. Uh, I mean, He's striking out two batters per inning. He's having a historic season. Uh, But the point is, is there enough around him? Is there enough to get to the ninth inning uh, without having to have him throw 35 pitches to get five outs uh, as as he did on Monday night? So that's where the question is. And look, Fujinami has looked good. I think he's part of that equation. I think you're going to see if the Orioles are in a tight game and have a chance to win tonight, you know, post-trade deadline, because whoever they acquire – presumably is not going to be there in time uh, to pitch in tonight's game unless you know unless you're getting someone for the blue jays but i don't think that you're going to see a trade like that it never uh, so rains in the Toronto. point is fujinami might have to pitch two innings tonight uh, i mean that's kind of where where we are right now but 
you look at the rest of the bullpen. Look, I like Danny Coulomb. He's he's been really good for them. You know, I I, I have a certain amount of trust in him. Mike Bauman has been more good than not for for the most part over the last couple months. Uh, he, you know, I kind of I kind of view him as, as I view viewed Brian Baker earlier in the year when he was pitching well. So, you know, it's not as though the cupboard's entirely bare. I don't know if I'd agree with uh, c- categorizing it as being on fire or anything like that, but it's just, you just don't have enough arms. Uh, and, and the guys that you're having to lean on in some of those medium leverage situations aren't getting the job done consistently enough. And look, let's be clear. This was not Michael Elias's plan. He signed Michael Givens in the offseason, who has given them, what, four innings this year because he hasn't been healthy. Dylan Tate has not thrown a pitch in the major leagues this year uh, and probably won't because I, I don't think he's going to pitch this year the, the way it's looking. And, and those were two guys that were counted on to be seventh and eighth inning guys for them. So Rodriguez essentially of, missed eight to ten starts, too, that, that he that they thought he would have taken, right? Well, I, I, I'm talking, but I'm I'm focusing more specifically on the bullpen right now. Fair enough. But, I'm just talking about innings in general. No, I got – Yeah. Yeah. So – I, I don't know if I'd say it's on fire as much, but you're trying to project out what's going to happen the next couple of months, right? I mean, it sounds silly to, to talk about this in terms of being panicked because, my goodness, they're 24 games over 500. They have the best record in the AL. What they've done to this point has been phenomenal. And that's why I keep saying they deserve some help. They deserve some reinforcements because you're trying to project out how the next couple of months are going to go. And I will say this, and I'll point this out, after a, a fantastic July where they went, what, 17-9? and nine, did not play a team that currently has a losing record. Uh, again, another impressive month. We talked about May in that context, right, with with the juggernaut of a schedule. They did it again in July. So this team has proven itself over and over and over again. However, it is a long season. Pitching and performing in August and September, let alone talking about October, is different than April, May, and June because the fatigue factor is real. So what can you add to kind of reinforce Take a little bit of the load off of Batista. Take take the foot off the gas with Cano, which I, I think needs to happen at this point. I think that's evident. You know, he, he pitched well on Sunday, but it's been a struggle for him more times than not at this point in time. Uh, and, you know, that's unfortunate because of how well he's pitched, but he's pitched a lot, you know, uh, to, to your point. So you've got to add uh, another piece. I mean, you could really make an argument for two more bullpen pieces, if we're being honest. And all right, out here, some of their internal candidates, like a DL Hall, maybe uh, in a few weeks, John Means in September. It's not as though they don't have some possibilities within their organization to add to the bullpen, but you got to add a bullpen arm. And you certainly, on the heels of what happened with Wells, you've got to add a starting pitcher. Uh, I mean, you just do. I just. I, I shudder to think what could happen to what has been such a good team. If you do nothing here today and Fujinami is the only thing you do over the trade deadline. And look, I expect them to make a move or two. Uh, doesn't mean I think it's going to be Justin Verlander, <laughs> to be very clear. But I think they're going to add a bullpen arm. I think they'll add a starting pitcher. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of what kind of profile is it? Is it someone that profile, you know, trends closer to another Kyle Gibson type? Which, by the way, wouldn't be terrible. You know, they need innings. They need competitive innings. You know, Kyle Gibson has been a positive for them. He's got a four and a half ERA. I know he's not great, but he's been a positive for them. You know, he, he's been a, a, a net positive uh, in terms of a player acquisition. So, you know, whether it's a Lorenzen, whether it's one of these rentals, you know, like a Jack Flaherty type, um, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, I there is there the possibility that it could still be a, a big move for I don't know, Dylan Cease, even though you would think the White Sox want to hold on to him, but they've traded everyone else. Uh, you know, he's under team control for a couple more years. That would be going and getting getting an ace, you know? Uh, I mean, so I don't expect that. But, you know, that's on the higher end of possibilities. The lower end is going and getting a rental. Maybe they feel like they need that's... an ace more than they need Colton Cowser. And they, and, and I maybe, mean, you know, like literally, maybe they're just sure. th- th- as as a stratomatic player. I'll hear that, right? I mean, yeah, as a fantasy well, rotisserie guy, I'll hear the 
I'll give you a Colton Cows or a Jordan Westberg and whatever you want if you're going to give me an ace because I'm worried about Rodriguez. Gibson ain't long haul. I don't know where my long haul guys are. At one point, we thought it might have been D.L. Hall. Why? I don't know where the next – where's our Where's our cease? Where's, I mean, Rodriguez is that guy, and he hasn't been that guy yet. We hope he is. And every time I hear Ben McDonald – on the broadcast, and I want to give you a little oxygen because I want to go a little longer today because you got a chance to watch the games. I love Ben on TV, and I think back to Ben McDonald and Messina and thinking about what one was supposed to be and what the other one wound up being, and we, you know, all that scuttlebutt with Buster Olney coming into town and being the bad guy and all that, but the 35 and Rutschman and not being Messina. You know, I think about who who are those – Who's the Glavin Smoltz? In, if they're going to win for five years, it ain't going to be with Kyle Gibson. I mean, I, yeah. I just don't think it's going to be with that. No, I, I don't think it will be either. And, you know, they've got some guys in their system that are coming. And, you know, Kate Povich being someone that they acquired uh, in the Jorge Lopez deal last year. And I don't know, maybe he's in the bullpen at the end of the year. But your point is well taken. And that's where we've talked about this. We've talked about this for a few years now. It, it's no secret that the Orioles have skewed heavily towards college bats in the draft and look that's worked out i mean even though gunner henderson high school player uh jackson holiday high school player and that's going to be the left side of their infield a year from now i mean barring an injury jackson holiday will be their shortstop by next summer i mean i i don't think there's any way to to deny that that's how talented the kid is uh but as talented as they are uh, as flush as they are with position player talent you're right so the logical assumption has been Probably not that you're going to go out and buy a ton of starting pitching, although they'll do some of that. And they've, you know, they've done that with, you know, Kyle Gibson's, but in order to land the big fish, you know, if it's going to be that ace, it's probably going to be, you know, a, a trade, something along those lines. So maybe it is Dylan Cease. Maybe when you and I reconvene and we're talking about this on Wednesday morning, they've acquired Dylan. Well, Cease. that would be I'm, incredibly bold, right? Oh, sure. I mean, and I don't know sure. as an organization, John hasn't done anything bold. He hadn't even signed a lease. Like, I mean, cease. Did that, did that rhyme with lease? Lease. Lease and cease. He'll never deal for him. So, I, but I, I literally, th- this is a time for accountability for them. We've held the Ravens accountable so much that they've thrown me out and only let you in. Um, you know, I, holding the Orioles accountable to the moment, getting back to the beginning of what you were talking about. This is a big moment for them. I mean, they'll have, there'll be other moments. Hopefully there's be- better moments than Delman Young's double, right? Hopefully it's a little better. We have better moments than that down the line. But it's in these moments, like when you decide to draft a high school kid and project him out as your shortstop before he's 21, right? Or draft a high school outfielder and think we can turn that kid into a power hitter and and a shortstop and, and, or a third baseman. I mean – they they made these decisions sort of in darkness to some degree on these these draft nights. The NFL draft is not made in darkness. I mean, every I fell asleep with Lamar Jackson and woke back up five minutes. It was midnight, and the whole world's paying attention to that. But the whole world's paying attention to this trading deadline. And from an activity standpoint, I see all these people down at the ballpark. I see the orange carpet. I see the squirt zone. I see Adam Jones running around doing his thing. He's all involved. Everybody wants to be involved in it. But now there's an accountability part that, that the old man never liked. You know, how dare you question the great King Peter? Yeah, I don't know. Elias is on front of this. I don't know how he comes back if they don't make a deal over money. And, you know, he has to carry the water for the family because Lord knows enough of these guys had done that for the period of time. But I think we're all, as much as you and I put 45 minutes into it this morning and all week long and everywhere I go, people are talking about it. There better be a WNST text from Coons Baltimore Ford coming out with something that feels like they're all in because the fans feel like they're all in. We're going down there, paying the money, paying the parking, coming, being a we're in. Everybody's in the city's in. You got to be all in, too. Not, well, we're three quarters in this year, but we're waiting on holiday and we're waiting on the count. No, no, no. What? What does that mean to this year's team and this? And, and Peter lived that way. Right. Peter never wanted to trade out because. People bought tickets. That was his original, I owe it to the fans to be all in this year because the fans are all in. Well, you know, I don't want to hear you're poor. I don't want to hear it's the turkey's not in the oven yet and it's still too young and we're going to grow the arms and buy the bats and, like, all of that. This is – they're in first place, man. Dude, they, they've got hundreds of millions of dollars they've squirreled up 
Like literally, they just like they haven't spent any money. So th- th- I don't want to hear that it's about money. If it's about prospects, fine. But I don't want to see somebody else's ace on another team in a deal that the Orioles could have made. And I we talked about that with Otani last week. I don't want to hear that anything's off the table over money or over prospects if somebody else is willing to do the deal and get an a get a young ace. You know. Well, Cause I don't know where their young ace is coming from. I don't, I don't, I don't know where that's happening. Well, Grayson Rodriguez could still be that guy. I mean, let's, you know, let's not. He got off to a rough start, but look, this is this is where I, I don't know if I agree with that. They're all in. You know, are they all in in the way that the Texas Rangers are all in with the payroll that they have and, and what they've invested? I don't think the Orioles are at that point, but, but there's a wide range of outcomes between. Fujinami being the only thing you do and going out and getting Justin Verlander and trading, you know, go, you know, going and getting just Verlander and Dylan Cease, let's say. And, and Doing again, the goofy Steinbrenner you know, Angelo mean, stuff from the 90s. Right, where, right, right, right. Like, so, so adding Jimmy Key's not enough. You had to add David Cohn and David Wells, right? Like, literally, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so do I think they're all into that degree where they're going to go out and make a crazy move and trade a, their best prospects and also take on a, a lot of money. I don't think they're at that point, but I want to see them do something here. It, it doesn't have to be Dylan Cease, but go get Eduardo Rodriguez. And and look, he's probably going to opt out, so that's probably a rental. So you theoretically shouldn't have to give up as much and maybe waiting until an hour before the deadline as opposed to some of these other rentals who were acquired over the last few days, maybe that actually turns out to be a good a good thing, and maybe you don't give up quite as much. Or sometimes that can mean that you might have to give up a little more than than you would have maybe four days ago for you know, Jordan Montgomery, you know, whoever you want to throw out that's already been dealt. So, so, but but your general point, I agree with. This team's been so good, you don't want to do anything to jeopardize for the future. I get that, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. Uh, but, but at the same time, you don't want to squander this opportunity that you have right now. That may not be your optimal chance to win a World Series over the next five years, but it's still a chance. It's still a legitimate chance. You know, I, I saw you know some comments from various talking heads and national pundits who have watched and paid attention to the Orioles more closely over the last month or so. And there are a lot of people that really like this team outside Baltimore too. Yeah, let, let's be clear about that. It's not just... Uh, local media and, and and fans with orange co- colored glasses. I mean, well, they win they have every the best night. The they league. have a bunch of yep. young players that are getting better every minute, right? Like literally, I, that that's the way right, I right. would. Right, So yeah. that's the way I would portray it. But they need more pitching. They they do, and, and that's where uh, again doesn't mean it's all in to the point where you're trading half your system. At the same time, you can be willing to part with a few pieces here and there. Why? Because you have the conviction that you're going to continue to draft well, develop well, add, continue to add more international talent, and you, oh yeah, you can still fix guys. You can still bring in broken guys and fix them in the way that they've done that with a handful of players over the last couple of years. So, you know, making a trade or two where, yes, you part with a couple prospects, that's okay because if you have conviction in your process and what you do as an organization, you should be able to make that up and then some over the next five years uh you know so it's not as though the prospects in your system are a finite resource you you just had a draft you know you just added uh another first round pick and, and more you know more talent that theoretically is going to be uh your next set of uh, of top prospects so you know uh, again there, there's a wide range of outcomes here from going truly all in and i don't think you meant all in in terms of like burning down your system trading for guys, but there's a, there's a, you can go for it while still maintaining a very healthy farm system. And that's what I want to see the Orioles do. And we'll see how this plays it out. It would be getting it's the not best necessarily... player possible, right? Getting the best player that's going to be dealt, the best pitcher, getting that guy. Cause that's what they uh, need. Yeah. I, I hear you at the same time. If there's a team out there that's, wild with their offer for a guy and you just say we're not going to do that in the same way that the Ravens value a player right you know the Ravens have a price for every player and you know like they wanted to keep CJ Mosley the New York Jets went nuts with what they offered CJ Mosley and you know what they said we're not doing that you still need to have discipline you still need to have conviction in how you value players and how you value where you are right now compared to the future so 
Well, they're it, not going to deal untouchables. Holiday's not going anywhere today, right? But, and we would think but Kowser my, but, isn't but my, either, but if you got an ace pitcher, you, you could make that case. Sure, sure. I mean, again, I'm not saying that there are 20 guys in their system that are untouchable. I'm not suggesting that. However, at the same time, you also want to be clear. You want to make sure that you're not dealing for something that you're saying is an ace that isn't really an ace. You know, uh, And that's where you just – you've got to be measured here. And Mike Elias, I, I, that's where I do trust that he will do that. Uh, you know, Michael Lorenzen was an all-star this year. Do I think he's truly an all-star pitcher who just blossomed at age 31? No. I, I don't think he's going to move the needle that dramatically, but he'd help them. I, I'm not opposed to, to acquiring him. You know, Jack Flaherty's not great, but I think he'd help them based on you know what they need in terms of another starting pitcher. So you know, we're just going to have to see how it plays out. And, and we'll certainly react and we'll probably overreact to what happens or what doesn't happen. But the point is there, there are moves out there still to be made, you know, whether it's – uh, on the high end, like a Dylan Cease or, or trying to get Mitch Keller from the Pirates, who uh, is someone that I know Brandon Hyde talked about very complimentary uh, earlier this year, but he's going to cost. He's going to cost a lot because he's got team control. And that doesn't mean the Orioles can't do that or shouldn't do that. But it is different than looking at some of these rental pitchers who will help you the next co- couple months. But, you know, unless you're talking about an Eduardo Rodriguez type, you can certainly question how much it's going to help you when you actually are playing in October. So we'll see how it plays out. But I, again, I think at the end of the day, uh, when, when the dust settles at 601 or 630, whenever the last deal was announced uh, as the trade deadline activity comes to an end, absolutely want to see the Orioles have a, another starter and another bullpen arm at a minimum. If they don't, then I'm going to have some concerns over the next couple months. Doesn't mean I think they'll collapse per se. Let's be clear about that. But I could definitely see it being way more of a struggle for them if they don't at least try to fortify with another starting pitcher and another bullpen arm of note. Birds north of the border in Toronto, Bradish, uh, Rodriguez. Uh, who knows? You might be starting here by the time we get to Thursday or Friday. Luke Jones can be found at Baltimore Luke. He can also be found on the backfields in Owings Mills because they don't let me in. Uh, he is double dutying up all night with baseball, around all day with football, and will be home um, with the Brave and the Mets and the Orioles this weekend, uh, as well as uh, as the Ravens getting going with some fake football happening here as we turn the page into August. It is our 25th anniversary on Thursday. We're going to be at Costas. I'm wearing the Costas shirt today because I couldn't find my fountain shirt. I'll wear my Drug City shirt tomorrow. We're going to be there on Friday. Costas 11 to 4 on Thursday. Drug City 11 to 4 on Friday. Uh, we will be giving away scratch-offs from the Maryland Lottery. I, I think Roz is getting me a fresh batch of these Instant Lottery throwbackers. We had a $100 winner. They were a lucky batch over at Coco's a couple weeks ago. Also, our friends at Window Nation, 866-90 Nation, celebrating the one-year anniversary of my windows on August the 8th. Uh, and we are going to be celebrating for the next 25 weeks here uh, at WNST, celebrating the 25 WNST stories of glory uh, and all the cool stuff we've done, including uh, trying to fix the team. So now that the team is fixed, we are appreciative. Thank you, Mr. Angelos. Uh, and uh, we're having fun, and we spanked the Yanks. If anybody wants any signs, oh, get nasty signs. We have hats, shirts, uh, stuff, giveaways, nasty newsletters, tchotchkes, hand-me-downs. Just stuff. We'll be giving that away at Costas from 11 to 4 on Thursday. And if you just want to stop by, grab the microphone, sing a song, tell an old story. If anybody has a Cedo Suck shirt that were one of mine, I'm looking for those. Or I'm looking for pictures of that. I have found the old barn ads and invitations and pictures I didn't know I had and stories written about me that I didn't know were ever written. So I'll be sharing all that on social media as well while Luke goes out and sweats it out. With the Orioles and the Ravens and the Maryland Crab Cake Tour on our 25th anniversary. I'm Nestor. We are WNST AM 1570 Taos in Baltimore. Get on that WNST tech service so you know who the Orioles deal for today. I'm sure it'll be Verlander, something exciting like that. Stay with us.